Hello, I'm Rutas Medina Stark. Welcome to my virtual lecture presentation, The Importance of Short Exercises for Mastering the Elements of Russian Piano Technique. I would like to discuss the title of today's lecture. There is probably no official term such as Russian Piano Technique, but I will explain why I have named the piano techniques in my discussion today, specifically Russian. The first reason is that during various stages of my piano studies, I have been taught by several representatives of Russian School of Pianism. Consequently, I have developed a special interest in the Russian School of Pianism and the techniques that Russian pianists and pedagogues use to acquire brilliant technical abilities in addition to superb musicianship. My Russian pedagogues always asked me to play short exercises, either for warming up or for practicing specific sections in a piece. All of the exercises were just given to me by a teacher. My teacher would play them and I would have to remember, memorize and later transpose. But none of these exercises were in a book where I would look them up. It was all just memorized. So there was no specific source. Then I came to realize that short exercises are an integral part of Russian school of pianism and decided to research them. I have used several sources for this study and they are Joseph Levine's book, Basic Principles in Piano Forte Playing, Vasily Safonov's New Formula for Piano Teacher and Piano Student, Hannan, Virtuoso Pianist in 60 Exercises, My Newfound Treasure, Leon and Olga Konus' book, Fundamentals of Piano Technique, The Russian Method, various short etudes and exercises by Karl Czerny, but specifically his Opus 500, Piano Forte Schule, Book 1. And then my greatest inspiration, Heinrich Neuhaus, The Art of Piano Playing. The second and very strong reason why I call technical elements we are discussing today elements of Russian piano technique is one knows that there could be several ways to classify elements of piano technique. But I find that Heinrich Neuhaus classification is quite valuable. This great Russian pianist and pedagogue defines eight main elements of piano technique which I will dis discuss later in great detail. It is a well-known fact that Russian school focuses first on developing great musicianship and musical abilities in a student, and technique is just a subordinate factor. However, in this discussion, I will focus more on so-called mechanical side of technique. At the same time, keep in mind that Russian school of pianism clearly indicates that technique and musicality go hand in hand and that they are somewhat inseparable. The layout of the lecture will be as follows. An introduction of sources for the study in detail. And then I will discuss and illustrate Heinrich Neuhaus' eight elements of piano technique with various short exercises which I have compiled. I will share with you some of my ideas how one can use short exercises to work on various elements of piano technique. And now I will introduce seven sources for this study and describe them in more detail. First source, Russian School of Pianism. Let me summate a few facts about Russian School of Pianism. It is interesting that Russian pianism started to develop during the last decades of the 18th century and flourished during the first half of the 19th century, especially with the Patriotic War of 1812, French invasion of Russia, when national traits started to emerge and Russian school of pianism started to develop. As a result, for the first time, Russia had its own professional performers, composers, and pedagogues. I have created two Russian pianist genealogy charts in which I have identified pedagogues and pupils of many prominent Russian pianists. Many, of course, not all. 
I have classified the pianists more relevant to this study. It is obvious that Muzio Clementi, as well as Ludwig van Beethoven, have had the most significant influence on many important Russian pianists up to nowadays, because they both trained Karl Czerny, the founder of modern piano technique. And Karl Czerny trained Theodor Leszczycki, who passed on his legacy to many Russian pianists. The first Russian conservatory was founded in St. Petersburg in 1862, which is relatively much later than its prototype Paris Conservatory, which was established in 1795. It is a well-known fact that Rubinstein brothers played significant role as founders of St. Petersburg and Moscow conservatories. Anton Rubinstein founded Petersburg Conservatory in 1862, and his brother Nikolai founded Moscow Conservatory in 1866. Another important music school is Gnesin Russian Academy of Music, founded by three Gnesin sisters. They all studied at Moscow Conservatory and later established their own school, which still remains in operation. These are conservatories. But now about education for children. Russian pianists and pedagogues realized that in order for one to become a successful pianist, there was a need for an early professional music school for children. They realized that a successful pianist has to be professionally taught by masters from an early age. As a result, Central Music School for Gifted Children by Moscow Conservatory was established in 1932 by professors Alexander Goldenweiser with help of Heinrich Neuhaus. This music school still remains in operation as well. I would like to say a few words about Alexander Goldenweiser. He was the founder, he was one of the founders of the Russian piano school first a student at Moscow Conservatory, and later he taught there for 55 years. It is interesting that Golden Weiser helped to establish the very system of teaching piano in Russia that has led to so many successful concert pianists up to nowadays. And that is why I consider Golden Weiser such an important representative of Russian school of pianism. Second source, Karl Czerny. Karl Czerny was a founder of modern piano technique. He was a pupil of Clementi and Beethoven. Czerny was a teacher of Liszt, Talberg, Kulak, Heller, and Leszczycki. And Leszczycki taught at St. Petersburg Conservatory and passed on Czerny's legacy to many Russian pianists. And that includes Joseph and Rosina Levine, pianists in our today's discussion. In my opinion, Karl Czerny has had a very great influence on formation of Russian pianism, and he is one of the strongest roots in Russian school of pianism. Czerny's exercises and short etudes focus on developing finger dexterity, strength, and velocity for beginner and intermediate level students. These exercises serve as preparation and build a great technical foundation for concert etudes by Liszt, Chopin, Rachmaninoff, and many others. In my opinion, besides building finger velocity and dexterity, Czerny's etudes and short exercises also have a considerable musical value, since they also focus on production of sound and expressivity of playing. Now a few facts about Czerny. Czerny was a child prodigy and started playing piano at the age of three. At the age of 11, Karl Czerny was introduced to Beethoven uh, by his piano teacher. Czerny studied with Beethoven for three years. At age of 15, he decided that career of a concert pianist was not for him and decided to dedicate himself entirely to piano teaching and uh, composing pieces for his students. His early piano teaching method was largely based on 
teaching style of Beethoven and Clementi. However, he soon invented his own original method of piano teaching. Czerny has composed numerous etudes and short exercises for piano. The most well-known ones are School of Velocity, Opus 299, and The Art of Finger Dexterity, Opus 740. However, there are many shorter exercises that I have found and are interesting. For example, 40 Daily Exercises, Opus 337, 30 New Studies in Techniques, Opus 849, Exercises in Passage Playing, Opus 261, but especially I was interested in Czerny's Opus 500 Book 1, Piano Forte Schule, which contains many interesting ideas about how to play scales, arpeggios, basic passages, and some of them I will demonstrate in a later part of my presentation. Third source, Joseph Levin and his book, Basic Principles in Pianoforte Playing. Joseph Levin was a pupil of Theodor Lashatitsky and Vasily Safonov. Levin was a Russian pianist and teacher who later in his life moved to United States and therefore brought Russian School of Piano Playing to the United States. He was born in Russia in 1874. He studied at the Moscow Conservatory, where he also became a professor after graduation. He married uh, his fellow pianist Rosina Bessi. They moved to Berlin in 1907 and in 1919 they moved to New York City. Levin was the first concert artist to be invited to teach at the, at the newly established Graduate Juilliard School of Music. Besides teaching, Levin also had an active concert pianist career. Levin was called the inward poet of the piano. He was regarded as one of the supreme technicians of his day by virtually all of his famous contemporaries, even Vladimir Horowitz. Levin considered that technique, although important, must be subordinate to musical understanding. In 1924, Joseph Levin wrote a book, Basic Principles in Piano Forte Playing. It gives a great insight into many aspects of Russian pianist training and is a source of ideas for some short exercises as well, used by Levin, which I will demonstrate later. In his book, Joseph Levin emphasizes the importance of first learning the basic mechanical elements of piano technique, like scales, exercises, and arpeggios, and compares them to an essential basis or foundation necessary for building beautiful and adequate artistic interpretation. Levin emphasizes that one can have too little scale practice, but never too much. In his book, Levin indicates that the Russian pianists have earned their fame for technical ability because they give adequate and very detailed study to the matter. Everything is done in the most solid and substantial manner. They build not upon sands, but upon rock. Fourth source, Vasily Safonov and his new formula for piano teacher and piano student. Vasily Safonov was a Russian pianist and pedagogue. He studied at St. Petersburg Conservatory with Theodor Leshetitsky. He was a master educator and a director of Moscow Conservatory. Among his students were Joseph and Rosina Levin. Safono wrote a technical treatise, New Formula for the Piano Teacher and Piano Student, and the main idea of Safono's formula was that, besides the traditional five-finger pattern, there are more finger combinations that are based on the position of the thumb in each of them. 
The Phono's exercise booklet contains many more short and interesting exercises for double notes, scales, chords, and arpeggios in various rhythmic patterns. The goal for those exercises is to develop evenness in touch, dexterity, and a good tone. Just another example that for Russian pedagogues, technique and musicality were of an equal value. And also another Safonov's idea, play always so that your fingers follow your brain and not vice versa. He recommends in playing, refraining from uh, looking at your hands and also memorizing and playing difficult passages with eyes closed, which I think is a very valuable advice and sometimes I recommend my students to practice a difficult uh, passage with eyes closed using this Safonov's idea. But Safonov emphasizes never forget to control the beauty of the sound. The main idea of Safonov's five finger formula is that besides the traditional finger five finger pattern, for example, G major, where thumb is placed on the note G. Safono indicates that there are many more finger combinations that are based on position of the thumb. So the next combination is where thumb will be placed on the note A. Then thumb will be placed on note B. And now thumb will be placed on the note C. And finally, thumb is placed on the note D. I think that that's a very interesting concept worth exploring. The fifth source, Leon and Olga Konus in their book, Fundamentals of Piano Technique, The Russian Method. Leon Konus was a Russian pianist pedagogue and composer. He was a student of Sergei Teneyev and Anton Arensky at the Moscow Conservatory. It is an interesting fact that Leon Konos studied together with Sergei Rachmaninov. After graduation, Konos stayed to teach at Moscow Conservatory and served as a chief professor of piano until 1918. Together with his wife, the pianist and pedagogue Olga Konos, they left the Soviet Union for Paris in 1921, where Leon Konos taught at the city's Russian conservatory, before finally moving to the United States in 1935. He taught in Cincinnati until his death at the age of 73. After his death, his wife published Fundamentals of Piano Technique, Russian Method, a set of piano exercises that focus on developing finger dexterity, velocity, and strength with a focus on proper hand movements. It also gives an insight into rhythm and articulation patterns for practicing various technical elements, as well as developing of touch, nuance, and musicality. I consider that ex this exercise book is a real treasure because it gives us insight into the secrets of Russian pianism, if I may say so, and many exercises and exercise patterns that are used by piano teachers. This exercise book can be used by students of all levels of development, starting from first years of study with easier exercises at the beginning, and up to very challenging exercises that can be used by more advanced students. All exercises are designed for hands to develop gradually, avoiding muscle tension, which is very important. This book focuses on very directly described hand movements, which is very interesting. All you have to do is read and instruct that to, to your student and I think that it's very helpful in all of those exercises. This book truly is a marvelous source of various exercises for mastering elements of piano technique. The sixth source, 
Charles Louis Hennon's virtuoso pianist in 60 exercises. Undoubtedly, Hennon's most well-known work is his virtuoso pianist 60 exercises. It was published in 1873 and is still used by piano students nowadays. Charles Louis Hannon was born in France, trained as an organist by a local teacher, and it is not known if he received any more formal musical education. Music was never the only focus for Hannon. He was also a devoted Roman Catholic. Hannon's exercises focus on speed, precision, strength, and flexibility in the wrists. The reason why I included Hennan's exercises in my today's topic is because Hennan's exercises were very highly regarded by representatives of Russian school of pianism. For example, Sergei Rachmaninov and Joseph Levin both considered that the secret of success of Russian school of pianism lies in the fact that Hennan exercises were obligatory throughout Russian conservatories at the time. Students were required to memorize, transpose, and perform at high speeds all of the 60 Hennon's exercises. Students also were required to take a special examination designated for Hennon's exercises alone. I have observed that my piano students get easily bored with regular uh, Hennon exercises, and I've discovered several ways from several sources of how to make Hennon's exercises more interesting. And one of them is Konus. Konus in his book recommends various ways of how to practice Hennon's exercises. So for example, for exercise number one, uh, one can use several rhythm patterns with dotted notes to practice the, the exercise for more efficiency. Or vice versa. And also using repetition. also offers various articulation ideas for each hand when practicing Hennon's exercises, like this. And so on. So where we use legato in one hand and staccato in the other hand. And also, an uh, interesting idea of using various rhythm patterns in each hand. And then changing. And then alternating note value from 8th note to 16th notes. Another challenging way to practice Hannon is by using fingers 1 and 2 only uh, to practice uh, the flexibility of thumb. That's quite a challenge and I'll demonstrate in the first exercise number 1. idea that I already mentioned before uh, about Hannon's exercises that I have taken from Russian School of Pianism is to transpose Hannon's exercises in all keys. So I'll demonstrate exercise number one in D major.
And finally, the seventh source for the study, the great pianist Heinrich Neuhaus and his book, The Art of Piano Playing. Neuhaus was an exceptional Russian pianist and pedagogue. He was an extraordinary artistic genius. Neuhaus was a pupil of Felix Blumenfeld, and he was also largely self-taught. And he trained Sviatoslav Richter and Emil Gillels, those two fantastic Russian pianists. In 1922, he began teaching at the Moscow Conservatory, and in 1932, he helped to establish uh, the Moscow Central Music School for Specially Gifted Children, which I already mentioned before. And from 1934 to 1937, he was director of the Moscow Conservatory, a position he relinquished to be able to devote himself entirely to teaching. His pupils, Emil Gillels and Sviatoslav Richter, called Newhouse an artist of unique genius, a great teacher and a great friend. In my opinion, as a personality, Newhouse was so unique because his artistic gifts were closely matched with such qualities as selfless devotion, deep humanity, true culture, and a great capacity for winning human friendship. He wrote this extraordinary book, The Art of Piano Playing, in which he shares his artistic and pedagogical ideas about piano playing and piano technique. The next part of my lecture is based on Newhouse Eight Elements of Piano Technique, in which I will discuss in depth each of Newhouse Eight Elements of Technique. First element, playing one note. Playing one note, according to Newhaus, is an interesting technical problem of its own because there are so many ways of how one can play one note. One note can be played with various fingering. It could be played using various dynamics from soft to loud. It could be played with various articulation as a quarter note, as a half note, as a whole note. And if a student has imagination, one note can be played with various moods, like happiness, sadness, energetic mood, happy mood. And here's an exercise that is based on Newhouse's idea about how to practice one note. First one note can be played piano, mezzo piano, mezzo forte, forte, it can be played staccato, or it can be played as a fermata, or it can be played with pedal. This exercise is really good if and helpful if there is a piece in which the first opening note is of importance. And for example, if my student is playing Chopin's study opus 10 number 6, I would uh, ask the student to practice this exercise to really decide what mood the first note should be played on. Levin points out that one should pay attention to the little things of, in music and that is he talks about various forms of staccato which students should be aware of. Levin distinguishes between three main forms of, of staccato. The first form of staccato is with the wedge which cuts off three-fourths of the note value. The second form of staccato, according to Levin, is with the dot, which cuts off note value in half. And the third uh, form of staccato is with a dot and dash, which uh, cuts off one quarter 
of the note value. And finally, the great Anton Rubinstein said that a player should prepare the first note already in his or her mind. Even before playing, it should be prepared in one's mind. Second element, playing two notes or a trill. A repetition of two notes produces a trill. Newhouse suggests two methods on how to practice trills. The first method will be playing the trill with fingers only, without participation of arm or wrist. Arm should remain relaxed at all times and play from pianissimo to forte, first slowly and then gradually faster. Also, Newhouse suggests to use all finger combinations, one, two, one, three, two, four, three, five, and so on. And here is the uh, exercise. method is quite the opposite. Now we are using maximum uh, vibration of the wrist, rotation of the wrist, and maximum movement, also starting from pianissimo and going up to forte, like this. This method is particularly helpful if the trill is loud or if the, the piece opens up with a trill, like is the case with the Chopin study, Opus 10, number 8. Konus suggests to practice trills with changing the wrist position. So there's a lot of attention to wrists, as I already mentioned earlier in conus exercises. So here is a conus exercise where he suggests to start with low wrist position and then gradually going up higher using the five finger position of a scale. suggestion for trill practice that Konos mentions is to practice the trill endings like this. Or to practice trills in various intervals like interval of a six, six apart, scales. Newhouse suggests that scales could be played artistically, that is starting piano, making a crescendo up to the top and back to the piano. Levin suggests that a good idea for scale practice is to play scale from first first note, then begin the scale from second note, third note, and fourth note, and so on, keeping the original fingering. So for example, scale of E major. Now we begin the scale of E major with note F sharp, which is second note of the scale. G sharp third note, keeping the original fingering. And so on. Kona 
Jonas' ideas about skill practicing are various. So one of them is changing the original fingering to just one and two only, which is quite a challenge if a scale has sharps or flats. I will demonstrate it in C major. Another of his ideas, play a scale holding down the note that is played and connecting it to the next note. as typical for conus and for scales he recommends playing dotted rhythms with making accents for the first and every other note. <laughs> to practice scales in various double intervals using various rhythm patterns in addition. So for example, scale of F major could be played in thirds, also using various rhythm patterns and keeping the original fingering. sharp minor could be played in a double interval of sixth as well using various rhythm patterns. Czerny in his Opus 500 recommends to practice scales in contrary motion and so on. Another interesting exercise in Czerny Opus 500 Book 1 is the following, which combines scales and arpeggios. Arpeggios will be next element we will discuss, but here is Czerny's exercise. Many representatives of Russian school recommend that a student should know all arpeggios with all the inversions and also play dominant seventh chord in arpeggio form as well as a diminished chord. I would like to share Newhouse idea about practicing arpeggios and uh, which includes practicing all chords, major minor, with their inversions, dominant seventh chord with its inversions and finished by a diminished chord.
suggests various exercises, short exercises for practicing arpeggios, but I will share a few of them which focus on flexibility of the wrists and relaxation of the wrists during the held notes or long notes, and uh, then followed up by 16th note groups. practice arpeggios using various um, rhythmic patterns that we find in Kona's book or students and, uh, and teachers can come up with their own versions of various rhythmic patterns. But here is Kona's exercise. And then another exercise for relaxing of the wrist on the long note while using accents for the 16th note groups to follow. Opus 500, Book 1, gives us very many ideas of how to practice arpeggios, but I would like to share this exercise of arpeggios in which each inversion is started with the original fingering. <laughs> double notes from 2nd to ninth and 10th. When practicing octaves, Newcomb suggests the following exercise. Playing only uh, the top part of the octave with pinky or fourth finger is necessary, with thumb being placed at a position of a, an octave, but actually thumb is not playing. Then thumb is playing and pinky is uh, at the position of an octave without playing. If a student is practicing a piece that has an octave pass passage, I would ask a student to use this exercise to apply it. And here is an example, Chopin's study opus 10 number nine for the coda section. suggest the following exercises for double intervals, for example, for the thirds, uh, starting the thirds in value of a quarter note, then eighth notes, and then finally ending up with sixteenth notes. C minor, D major, D minor, and so on. Kona's suggestion for uh, practicing sixth, one of the suggestions, there are many in his book, but this is the one I prefer, is the following. <laughs> For 
Chopin study opus 10 number 3, I would ask my student to transpose this exercise in a key of E major. of the study. I like Czerny's short exercise Opus 261 number 9. For, for, for the practice of thirds. Czerny recommends to repeat each of the two measure phrases 30 times, but we can change that, I think, and we could practice four or six times, or as Vasily Safonov suggests, that we can practice a number of times, like three, five, seven, and nine. And here is that short exercise. Sixth element, playing chords. The most important thing in playing chords is to play all notes simultaneously or being able to bring out certain parts of a chord, like this. First, I will bring out the pinky. Now the third finger. And then second. And then thumb. Success uh, depends on putting the pressure on the finger that I want to bring out at a time. Here is Newhouse Newhouse's chord practice exercise that consists of playing uh, the major chord and then dominant seventh chord and all its inversions. Rubinstein said that the chord must be ready in the thought of the player before the hand opens. The chord must never be prepared in a stiff position, for the sound becomes hard and wooden. I think that's a valuable idea to think about, that one should prepare a chord already in one's mind before even playing it. Here are some conus ideas about how to practice chords with a uh, Octaves interchangeably. And here is Conus exercise that I would like to share. recommends to practice chords in contrary motion with a third apart and I really like his exercises 
four chord, its inversions, and also dominant sevenths with all of its inversions. Seventh element, jumps and leaps. According to Newhouse, the shortest path between two points on keyboard is a curve. Accuracy depends on will and training. I would like to share Kona's exercise for jumps and leaps in chromatic octaves. <laughs> for Chopin's study opus 10, number 4, in code section. And I would like to share Cherny's exercise opus 261, number 54, which also focuses uh, on, fo on leaps, but just on a smaller scale and maybe for an intermediate student. And also this exercise has consider considerable musical value to it. Finally, the eighth and last element, polyphony. Newhouse suggests that to master polyphony, one should practice preludes and fugues by Bach, also by uh, Taneyev, Reger, Glazunov, and Shostakovich. But I also found some interesting elements of polyphony in some of Cherny's short exercises, and I will demonstrate one of them, which is Cherny's Opus 261, number 105 which has not only some nice elements of polyphony, but also some musical and artistic value to it, I think. And in conclusion, I would like to share Sergei Rachmaninoff's short exercise, which is just to emphasize that uh, many great Russian pianists and composers composed their own short piano exercises for warm-up. This exercise was written down by Leon Konus. I already mentioned the fact that Sergei Arachmaninov and Leon Konus were classmates at Moscow Conservatory. This Rachmaninov's exercise focuses on weak fingers of the hand, that is three and five and four and two, and this is an exercise in chromatic intervals.
pleasure to share with you my ideas and findings about the importance of short exercises in mastering the elements of Russian piano technique.